Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Today I'm going to take a look at the transition pictures of one of the greatest and most beloved singers of all time, Frank Sinatra. He died in 1998 at the age of 82 after an incredibly tumultuous but ultimately highly successful career. He won an Oscar, he won Golden Globes, he won multiple Grammys, he sold about 150 million albums in his life time and came from pretty rough beginnings. His mother was pretty tough on him and his father was a boxer or wrestler or something at the very beginning in New Jersey and he came from there to one of the most highly regarded performers in music history. Of course he made a bunch of movies as well including Pal Joey, High Society, From Here to Eternity, Guys and Dolls and so on but it's really as a singer that he's most noted. He was on Capitol Records for years and then at some point he got sick of them. They had a, a four out and he started his own record company in 1960, Reprise Records. And this is the most remarkable success story. It's because he started Reprise Records that he became known as, nicknamed as, the chairman of the board, because he was. And on the label were the people you would expect, like Dean Martin, Bing Crosby, Duke Ellington. But later on, it was the Beach Boys and the Kinks and Jethro Tull and Jimi Hendrix and Fleetwood Mac, all the way up to Josh Groban and Green Day. It's quite a remarkable story. Uh, Reprise is now owned by Warner Brothers and uh, Frank Sinatra's catalogue is owned, ironically, by Capitol Records. But it is the most fascinating and tumultuous and turgid life. He even was connected with the mob at one point and used to go to mafia conventions. <laughs> so he's a very, very complex man. I didn't know that much about him when I embarked on this. So first of all, I did his handwriting, which I'll tell you in a second. And then... I went on and did his pictures and only then did I look him up and find out the details about his life. But uh, we'll start with the handwriting. I did it from his signature, which is basically all I had, but uh, this is what the signature reveals about Frank Sinatra. The public face was a stark contrast to who he was in private, where showmanship and there was lots of that, gave way to a sharply intelligent and quite perceptive man. On the surface, a dominating presence. Behind that, though, a lot more composed, thoughtful, and internalized in terms of his true feelings, which was typical of men of that era who were expected to conduct themselves in a certain way, especially celebrities. He had this big, showy front that concealed inner turmoil, insecurities, worries, and so on. His true feelings could be dark, intense, impatient, and even explosive. He didn't like to be messed with or to deal with idiots or anyone who tried to outsmart him. He thought he knew better, and you needed to live up to his expectations and his standards. There was concealed rage here, I thought, rooted, I assumed, in childhood experiences. This made him vulnerable, and therefore he tended to be more self-protective, put on a bigger show, be louder, be more uh, domineering in order to protect his tender self. He could be persuasive, even a charmer when he needed to be, but it felt to me somewhat contrived like it was a put-on as a way to get people to artificially like him or to go along with his plans. At the back of this was a need for control and a deep fear of not being in charge or of circumstances running away with him. He used his style and status to steer situations to his advantage and in the direction he liked. He was quite passionate in his beliefs and unlikely to buckle if you challenged him. He was a lifelong Democrat. I think towards the end, I think he became a Republican, but he was mainly a Democrat who championed civil rights and the rights of black people to play in clubs and to attend clubs and so on. There was something about his approach to life that drew heavily on 
A, the inward processing of past experience and old pain, and B, a bunch of deeper feelings that were like an engine powering his persona, but which wouldn't be put on show, not unless it was in the company of people who really knew him. These feelings were not for general consumption. As far as he was concerned, it was enough that you accepted that he had good reason for his behavior, attitudes, approach, and reactions. You simply had to trust that he knew what he was doing because he might never give you a full insight into the why or the what. He seemed to be pulled in different directions and trying to keep a foot in every camp, but staying abreast of everything sapped a lot of his energy. He had a multi-tier field of operation that stretched his ability to control what was going on. Part of it was that he may have considered himself smarter or more aware than others. Another part that he didn't want others to tell him he shouldn't or couldn't do something. He wanted to call the shots and guide the ship. If you annoyed him or offended him, he might take it quite personally and would not be easily won back again. He'd turn up his nose and maybe feign permanent hurt dismissing your subsequent apologies and supplications. You might have to crawl back, and even then, he might not be entirely forgiving. You'd really have to work to uncross him. He was a clever, circumspect kind of guy. Conscientious, hardworking, detail-oriented, highly focused on what needed to be done, and could feel deeply unappreciated when he was criticized for not doing as well as expected. I suspect that his sensibilities were hemmed in, constrained, delineated, and filled with resentment about the way certain people had treated him in youth or as he was coming up in the business. This caused him to swing the other way by dominating others or situations or speaking his mind in such a way that others felt dwarfed by his presence, his arguments, and his resistance to their arguments. He felt he had to be this way, otherwise fools would prevail and things wouldn't be done right. He was synced up with the voice of his intuition through which he channeled his gifts. This is so often the case. When people, like the general public, relate to a particular performer, it's because that person isn't really performing, they are channeling. Their soul is a conduit for some kind of divine input, uh, inspiration. And we, as listeners, respond to that. We know intuitively when God is speaking to us through someone, someone with a gift, someone with talent. And that's what happened with Frank Sinatra, which is why he was so popular. He knew what others didn't and had the receipts the justifications, the reasons for his actions, and would argue his case directly, even fiercely, when he felt he was right, which I think was most of the time. You certainly wouldn't want to face off against him. There was an intensity there that might explode. When he was alone and not the center of attention, he was low-key, reflective, considered in his approach, and possibly at the mercy of his darker moods and feelings of being an underdog that he still harbored from youth. And that's Frank Sinatra's handwriting. He was a Catholic, apparently, very, very committed Catholic. And uh, his funeral was in a Catholic church in Beverly Hills. Years ago, during my Hollywood heyday, I wrote a book called Why Your Life Matters. And every day for an entire month, for an hour, I would go into a church and pray because I wanted to see what the effects on me were of solid prayer. So that was 30 or 31 days of prayer every day for an hour. And one of the churches I went into for that uh, was the Good Shepherd Church in Beverly Hills. And that's where Frank Sinatra's funeral was held in 1998. As I said, he was 82 years old, very sick at that point. He had bladder cancer, apparently, and pneumonia. He'd had one heart attack already, then he had another, and that's what saw him off. Interestingly, that is reflected in 
the transition pictures because when I went into his energy, I was looking down to a cliff path that was below me and there was a tunnel on this side and a tunnel on that side. And as I watched Frank Sinatra came out of this tunnel on all fours for some reason, but he was galloping on all fours. He shot along the little path and into the other tunnel. So there was an illness, the first heart attack, presumably, then a reprieve represented by the little path, and then the second heart attack, and he was gone. But he shot into the tunnel that I always see at that point at great speed on all fours, and he made it quite a way along. So that by the time he reached that metaphorical cave I always see in these pictures, he was exhausted. The man was pooped and he just lay on the floor, metaphorically speaking, he lay on the floor unable to get up. It's almost like he'd been mugged in an alleyway and just left for dead, that kind of thing. Except that now he really was dead and he'd worn himself out. Maybe by trying too hard in his life, working too hard. Apparently he only had like four hours sleep a night because he worked so hard. That would explain this. He was pooped and could barely stand. There was barely enough life force left within his consciousness for him to function during this transition. Eventually, and I waited quite a while for him to get his act together there, but eventually he stood up and saw the tunnel. And the light was at the end of the tunnel. And I guess as a lifelong Catholic, he thought, there we go, there's God. And I saw him kind of adjust himself. Obviously, there's no clothes in the transition, but there was that sense of if he had been wearing clothes, he would have been adjusting himself, getting ready to meet God, because that's what you do. You go to church with a suit on and so on. It's that kind of official thing. And he started walking up the tunnel. But what was fascinating about this was that as he walked, he didn't seem to get any closer to the light. The tunnel just got longer and longer and longer. And he kept on going and climbing and climbing and he didn't get any closer and he became very frustrated. He had certain expectations about this process, certain things that he believed were true about his status, perhaps, about God, about the way one dies, and so on. It was all set in place for him. And maybe he believed that by doing so much in his life, he had earned a special place in heaven. That's what it felt like. But until he was able to let go of these expectations, he wasn't allowed to get into the light. It's like, no, let it go. Whatever you believe, let it go. Wearing him down. You got the message yet? Do you hear us, what we're saying? Let it go. And he carried on walking. And the more he was able to offload his beliefs, the further he got, the more progress he made. But as he moved towards the light, he came across, it wasn't a trench, it was like a deep, deep, deep ravine across the entire tunnel and too wide for him to leap across. And he looked down and he thought, oh, I'm going to hell. I can't make it to where God is. I'm obviously going down. And again, I waited because this was incredibly puzzling, apparently. There is no hell. It's just made up. But in his head, in his belief system, as part of his preconceptions, hell did exist. And it was there for certain people to fall into. Certain people who couldn't cross this ravine and make it to hell. And he stood and he looked and I waited. And I got the distinct feeling that this was all about faith, with a little f. That it's all very well going to church and believing in God and the Bible and so on and being able to recite scripture or whatever. But 
unless you have true faith that the universe is on your side, that you live in a benevolent system that has your back, which is true, we all do, unless you are plugged into that light of the divine and believe it, then yeah, you might think that uh, the sins of the ego will take you down. And there's a sense here that the more he was prepared to have true faith, and let go of the tenets of his old faith, the mortal faith with a capital F, the more he was able to do that, the narrower the little chasm, ravine, trench became. And suddenly there was this epiphany for him that faith with a capital F was made up and not true and that there was nothing out there to fall back on and the more one had faith in oneself and one's divine core and connection to all that is the more one had that the more easily one accessed the power of grace and that's true on this side of the divide you don't have to die to realize that and sure enough the ravine got smaller and tighter and he was just able to jump over it and carry on. And yet there was still, I felt, a touch of the ego about him. The Frank from the mortal side. Because he stood in front of this dome I always see. It's very symbolic. It doesn't really exist. But he stood in front of this dome I saw. And it was like, so did I make it? Am I good? Do I get in? As though it was some kind of exclusive nightclub or whatever. That's the old ego self. Did I make it? Am I worthy? Do I deserve the best? You're automatically entitled to the best by virtue of your connection to the divine. That was the lesson this was teaching him all the way. And he waited for some kind of sign or message or whatever and nothing came. Just the light, just him. And after a while, he went, oh, okay, I get it. Let's go. And he just stepped into the light and went. But this whole process, which seems very convoluted, but it happened in a very short time, actually. But this whole process was about taking away his faith with a capital F, a lot of which is based on superstition and false beliefs and so on, mortal rules, mortal principles, and replacing those at the ravine with faith with a little f, faith in self, faith in one's connection to the universe, one's divine sovereignty, one's power uh, as a small god because we are offshoots of the main God, the infinite intelligence of the universe. That was his lesson. Humility, letting go of preconceptions. We don't earn our access to uh, the light. We simply shed all those things that prevent us ascending and being lifted up by grace, which is what he realized in those final few seconds and that's what i learned from frank sinatra i'll see you very soon guys thanks a lot bye bye